in the seventies, there were less than, what is it? 5% of, of households where the woman was the primary breadwinner for the family. And then what happened in the early seventies? Well, this is when uh, title IX reform was passed by Congress, which was a movement to try to increase the amount of women going to college. And they felt that it was a terrible thing that, that in the colleges at the time in the early seventies, that there, that men were, I think it was 13% more men were in colleges than women. So to, to, to really close that gap, so much was poured into the colleges to try to encourage greater female enrollment. Like one of the things that started happening was they, they even did things like, you know, having the same amount of money for female sports as for male sports or whatever. Every, every area had to be equalized. There was no appreciation for number one, if, is there a masculine and feminine distinction here that needs to be honored? And number two, what is this, what will this do to the, to future families? Um, and so I think one of the most unmarriable people on the planet is a 30 year old single woman with a master's degree because she's hypergamous and she's looking for the, the, you know, the, the guys that are her at her level and higher, right. The 32 year old guy with a PhD is she's competing with 25 year olds, right? Like it's, yeah, it's, right. this is not being told to women that this is actually potentially really going to make it difficult for you to find somebody to date. The other thing that, you know, shocked me, I think we talked about before that they're beginning to discover is that a woman on hor hormonal birth control will find a more effeminate man, more attractive until the minute she goes off of birth control, then all of a sudden all of her hormones switch back to, to normal. And she no longer wants to be with a, this beta effeminate uh, man. Like, so we're, we're monkeying with all of these things. And so yeah. title nine, you know, it, it was trying to collapse this 13%. Um, and I, I don't, several years ago, the, the statistics were that 16% women were, we're now six, made up more than 16% of, of um, colleges, uh, more than men. So, so, not, so, we, so all of Congress and we passed all these reforms and, and had this massive movement in the country to try to close a 13% gap, which, which really was damaging to the family, I would say. Not in, not in every individual case, but overall, you can look at the, st the statistics, like families were way more healthy before we did this. I don't know how much this contributed to it, but now we have the opposite. So what's happening now is that women are gaining status academically at a, at a pace that outpaces men, going into more debt um, than men uh, to, to get that status, those college degrees, and then graduating, hoping to eventually become a mother and start families. And again, we're not having an honest conversation about what just occurred. Like did, did that make it less likely? And is this part of the reason why we have, you know, what some are now calling an epidemic of childlessness, which is women who turn 30 and want to have a child, but are not in a marriage, have a less than 50% chance of ever, ever becoming a mother. Nobody's telling women that. And so women are, you know, getting these degrees, wanting to spend at least three to five years, maybe more working in their degree area. After all, they spent probably four to eight years getting the degrees and going into debt for it. So why not at least spend that much time working in the field? But by the time you complete that whole cycle, you're in a really tough spot um, yeah. biologically and temperamentally, right? Um, and so again, this is, this, is a, this is a really hard conversation. There's no real easy way. A lot of this is by way of talking primarily if people are asking like, well, what do we do with this stuff? This is, this is extremely important information to know when you're raising children, especially daughters. Um, it's like, what is your intuition? What are the things you're reinforcing when you're raising daughters? Do you want your daughter to someday become a mother? Does your, do you think your daughter one day will want to become a mother? There's a huge, like, I think it's, I think it's like over 80% of all women will someday want to be a mother. So I think it's a safe thing to, especially if you're lifting that up. I think a lot of the women who don't want to be a mother had a really bad experience with family, father, motherhood, family, or so, some level. But it's really important that if you're raising daughters in a very healthy family, the chance that they're going to want to someday be a mother is extremely high. So why would you do things that are culturally being engineered to make that more difficult and less likely or to do damage to their future family? Um, and what does that look like at an individual level? I think we have to really look at it and try to understand, like, I want my daughters to pursue things that they really care about. I want them to, to be able to fully enjoy all of the gifts and the callings that God's placed on their life. What I don't really have any interest in is for my daughters to uh, compete in some kind of 
culturally created um, uh, game where accumulating degrees and um, and winning in, in a competitive capitalistic uh, workplace are the primary way they're going to get their identity. No, that's not a good idea for women to to go into that world. Um, that again, I don't I don't see that as the same uh, as pursuing all the things that God has for them. I think that I think we've sort of smash those two concepts together. And says the way right. that you pursue callings as a man or a woman is through is through assuming that everything that happens in a hyper capitalistic economy and and trying to win that game is the way you get that identity and that meaning. And I think there's so many other ways to get identity and meaning, um, including ways to pursue education and work that don't include that pathway, trying to compete in that way. So yeah, April, any other thoughts on uh yeah, that collision with work and well I just I I agree with what this this man is saying. I just want to acknowledge that because, like you said, it's just not said enough. Um, it's not out there. And I think that, you know, I, I've heard it said, um, people who don't have kids, they they don't know what they're missing. And and I'm so glad that they don't. Because if they did, they would be so sad. And so I, I feel something like that. I feel like, you know, to the six-year-old woman who devoted her life to her career, um, my heart goes out to her because I know that at some, if she hasn't already and if she's honest with herself at any point in life, it's going to be hard and painful. And so I, I, um, I think it's a real, we're establishing a whole section of people in our culture that fit into that category. Yeah. Yeah. So guys, yeah, we want to help and take a big step back. We love family. We love family teams. We love working together. I think, I think daughters in particular can find so much meaning in a multi generational family context. I think a lot of work that w- that women can do to earn money in the context of a multi generational family. There's so many opportunities there. The caring, the there 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 are things that we just aren't exploring or aren't talking about. For some of you guys who are building, maybe your Gen One of a multi generational family. Hold on. Be careful. Please do not raise your daughters to uh, to pursue sort of the typical Western hyper individualistic, uh, hyper independent kind of lifestyle. I don't assume that that default is going to serve your your daughters' uh, goals, dreams, identities, um, and happiness. Well, it won't. Um, uh, in so many cases, this isn't working well for so many women. 